It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Well, this is going to be fun, Steph. Yeah, this has been in the works for a while, and we're so happy to have the Arthur Black, Arturo Negro, joining us today. Welcome, Arthur, and thank you for getting out of your avocado tree to hang out with the Wine to Five ladies today. <laughs> oh, you make me miss my avocado tree. <laughs> um, I had to come down sometime. No, it's awesome to uh, to be on the show. We have been talking about this for a while. And I know, uh, Valerie, and it, do you go? Do you do like Val, or is it just Valerie, or? Either one. Okay, because some people are hardcore about that shit. Like, you know, it, it's either Michael or Mike or... You know, I've had people get mad at me. I call them Mo when their name is Maureen, and I, you know, whatever. Arthur, Arturo, <laughs> Artemis. Um, what do you prefer, Arthur, Arturo? Yeah, Arturo Negro. <laughs> um, <coughs> Arturo Negro. Yeah, well, yeah. Arthur Black, Black Arthur. That that's kind of one of my stage names, but I, I don't really care. I um, whatever is fine. I, I do have a couple of other identities out there, like uh, self destructive Arthur. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's not a good one. Um, makes for great stories, uh, no doubt, and has his own reputation in the industry. But I recently, down in my avocado tree, kind of came to terms with Arthur Child of God, which is a whole different speed okay. of, of, of person and in beverage totally. uh, professional we're seeing. But um, yeah, Arthur's fine. Steph, Stephanie, Steph. You know, uh, I go by Steph. For anybody who you know knows me personally, and I used to always get so offended when people would introduce me to somebody as Steph, and then I have just recently got over that because I think that's just bullshit. <laughs> I should just let it go. Yeah, that that's an easy one to just scrap and get that off the table of things to be concerned yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. Huh. I think you know. I think what it was is that when I was graduating. They announced as I was getting my uh, doctorate, they're they're announcing Steph. Jansen and I'm like oh come on this is the most formal thing I've ever done and it should be Stephanie you know but I think everybody knows me as Steph so that's just the way it goes all right uh, <laughs> I think did, um were you, you weren't in, in oh where the hell were we Valerie Portland Portland oh yeah yeah, yeah. How, how could I forget were you out in Portland yes yeah, but I didn't. I wasn't in the same class that Val was. So I think when you guys were chatting it up, I um, was in another session, Got doing it. doing something. I'm sure, but uh, yeah. So I've I've taken your classes before the Mezcal class. When was that? Oh, that was a couple man, years ago. That was Seattle. <clears throat> was Seattle. Yeah, that was a fun one. That, Ooh, was. that was like four years ago or something. I think that was. Yeah. The first that was the first uh, conference I think I'd ever been to as well as you, Steph. Right? Yeah, yeah, my first too. And I remember oh. some some of the greatest hits from that mezcal. The if you have a donkey, you're a pimp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the pachuga. Uh, yeah. And that, somebody asked sure. Arthur, "Why is the pachuga distilled with a chicken?" And you said, "Who cares? It's a chicken." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so <laughs> funny. It I mean, it was so just, it was great. I still have the notes. I loved that class, and I thought this dude. So, what if you ever see comments? You know, I don't. If you get the comments from your seminar, it says this dude. That's usually me. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, you know, it, it's just, there's so many funny things about our industry, and, and um, so many like brilliant things that have happened, or peculiar things that have happened which most likely alcohol was a part of, of the genesis, you know, like this was conceived inebriated. Like why would someone think I should percolate this mezcal through a dead chicken? And there's, there's one answer. Fucking mezcal is why you think that putting the chicken in the top of your still is a good idea. Right. Uh, and it is a good idea. Um, you know, it, it, whatever. Uh, these, these, these things happen. Um, these wonderful stories and uh, occurrences. So, um, yeah, I had fun in, in Seattle, and I'm stoked you guys were attended, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you don't have thin skin. I don't think I'd be on this podcast if um, if that weren't the case. So oh, We're not scared. No. Yeah. No, Acquired we're not. Acquired taste and all. Here I am. No, yeah. we're glad you're here. What are you drinking today? 
I got two things, uh, really. And uh, keep in mind, like for the past, oh God, uh, it's it's really kind of like a 2018 thing. I, I sort of actually went dry, um, just for an experiment, I guess. So I'm really not partaking much these days. But we're gonna break that for your show. Oh yay! Uh, yay! And <laughs> enable the uh, the guy with way too many vices. Um, <laughs> I have a sample of a spirit that I was making with some cats up in Chicago, a few distillery earlier this week, because I like to um, to go and, and hang out with, um, you know, at distilleries or breweries or wineries or whatever and poke my head in production whenever uh, I can. So I brought um, some samples back for a, a Spirits Academy that I'm actually launching that is trade and orientation, but it's real tasting heavy. And it's a real technical distillation heavy, like, you know, really, really get into um, into the heart of it uh, that is, is production and spirits at large. But I want to taste my students on a number of different cuts of spirit coming off the still, different OVs that have spent time in different barrel regimens for different periods of time and different genres of, of, of oak and, and all this stuff. So I, basically, I got a bunch of stuff that you can smell and assess, but you shouldn't probably drink for the hell of it and I, i'm nosing a bourbon mash or a bourbon recipe it's 70 percent corn with um about 20 percent rye and about 10 percent malted uh, barley thank god for malted barley and all the enzymes it brings um to, to alcohol so that's just kind of interesting and different it's kind of cheesy and, and methanol heavy you know when you're coming off the still you're not getting those attractive alcohols and you're getting weird you know lactic uh-huh. funky, reductive burnt garlic kind of things but um it does drive home a point point. and then i figured what the hell if i'm going to maybe imbibe today during our podcast i might as well get double fisted so i poured a glass of whatever was in reach and that happened to be a ball of amarone uh-huh. Uh-huh. wow what a scale and this is also something we're going to talk about because you are very diverse in your appreciation and knowledge and the way you dig into alcohol. I mean, it's just... You, All over the place. I know. <laughs> I think that's awesome. I had an Italian bottle open, but like you, I haven't <laughs> I haven't imbibed in seven days, actually. I was actually right ill. On. Yeah, I was actually ill last week, so it wasn't by choice. I opened a great bottle of uh, Tuscan uh, Brunello producer that I love, the Potazzine, and I had one glass, and then I... I got some kind of crud on Saturday, and so I'm on my seventh day without booze. I know everybody out there is like, what? Yeah, it happens. Mm-hmm. So uh, something tried to take me down. I'm still recovering. And so I'm actually, I have like a tea cocktail, if you will. So this is like ginger tea. It's like an herbal tea. Ooh. And uh, yeah, I love ginger. And then what I have is this Korean citron tea. And I don't know if you guys ever seen it. It's in a jar. Okay. It's honey and it's peel from this citron fruit, and it looks. Do you like, have it in front of you, Val? I don't. It's downstairs because it's a big ass oh, jar. Shoot. So okay. it's. I found it in Korea. I was spending way too much time about eighteen years ago in the Songtan juicy bars at night, and then to this day. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, we need to come back to that. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was I was mistaken for a Russian juicy girl, and they wouldn't serve me beer because they thought I was supposed to be on the pole, apparently. And uh, so my girlfriends and I, we go the next day to this little place where they serve the citron tea, and I swear it cures everything. But you just put it in hot water, and it's just like honey and citron. And so I mix it in with the ginger tea. It's like my winter whoopee. And I found a Korean grocer a couple weeks ago that has this stuff. Oh, cool. So originally I had brought it back in my luggage from Korea and this was back in like 2001, I think it was. And so now I'm really happy. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at your Korean grocer. You can put it in your hot water uh, tea, add bourbon, makes a nice toddy. It does have a lot of peel in the bottom when you're done drinking it, but I like to chew on that. And then uh, we cook oh, with it. Oh, the dregs, yeah. The yeah, you can stuff. glaze carrots with it. I mean, you can do a lot of stuff with it, but it's that's what I'm kind of sipping on today. So I'm just kind of staying, staying clean so I can kind of heal from whatever this mess is that I got last week because I don't get sick very often and I don't take it well. So. <laughs> yeah, tea's, tea's kind of my new jam. And any time that anyone has... has assumed that I should be up on a pole. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, I've taken it as a compliment, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so absolutely. In a backward way, that, that, that was a very nice thing for that man to say to you, Valerie. It was a woman. Oh, even better. Right yeah. On. Yeah, we went up to uh, the bars, and she wouldn't, 
pour me a beer. And finally, they made me go up and show her my military ID so she knew that I wasn't supposed to be reporting for work, a different kind of work, a different kind of duty. So <laughs> now, yeah, to drive home my point, that probably wouldn't be nearly as interesting as it is if alcohol wasn't involved when that happened. Right. Yeah. You know, like you just found yourself in a <laughs> circumstance. So, uh, Stephanie, what, uh, what are you sipping on? I have a Monte Falco Rosso from Scott Chidiavoli, and uh, the reason why I'm drinking it is because I opened it on February 12th, over a month ago, and it was my experiment with the Repour wine saver, and I wanted to see if it really worked for, for good, you know, and I'm super impressed. I just opened it, like, right before we Skyped you, and it tastes like the bottle's never been opened. Hmm. This so is not I'm, a commercial. It's not a <laughs> this commercial. This is not an ad. Like, <laughs> I'm just super happy with this. So uh, I'm I'm excited and uh, and the wine's good. So you know I'm I'm not very good at taking days off of drink. You know not drinking and uh, <laughs> so I've been on a roll the last few days actually. Nice. And, uh, yeah. So this just you know. It's hitting the spot on uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, and we're all thinking Italy. What is it about this yeah. crazy country of 20 different regions and all these variations of grapes and styles? I um, love yeah, it. Great place to visit, no doubt. It's a great place to live, um, too. I mean, <laughs> if I had my choice, I'd be living there half the year. But let's get let's get into who we're talking to. You know, we've been talking to Arthur now for about 15 minutes and most of you are going, so who is Arthur? <laughs> who is this guy? And so we thought we would, uh, we would give a little introduction real quick, but he's one of the very few young beverage industry educational leaders in the country, believe it or not. He acquires so many titles and accreditations over 15 years. He makes Steph and I look like a couple of slackers. Arthur is the <laughs> oh. corporate wine and spirit sales manager for RNDC. That's for public national distributing, right? Yeah, but now that you mentioned who I work for, this is probably going to be more PG-13 than, than X, but that's all right. I can take it out. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's cool. <laughs> right on. It, 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 that, they got plenty of other things to fire me for than, than whatever might happen in this podcast. All right. Well, Arthur is also, a, it, or RNDC is a leading national wholesaler of fine wine and spirits. For those of you that don't know, he is a certified specialist of wine and a certified specialist of spirits through the Society of Wine Educators. And that's how we all met. He's also a certified pick one of the below. Spanish wine <laughs> educator, French wine educator, sake specialist. He's an advanced sommelier, Cicerone level one, and advanced level three through the WSET. And he's an active educator, as you may have gleaned, and in the American sommelier community, as well as the founder and president of Indiana Craft Beverage Association. Mm -hmm. And there are few things in life he enjoys more than yoga and a glass of grower champagne, but not at the same time. And he's also the co-host of the Shift Drink podcast with his buddy and restaurateur, Ed Rudisell. And this hilarious show actually started in 2016, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that probably sounds right. Yep, and that takes edutainment to the next level if you haven't figured that out already. But what well, else do you... Did, you... did you just say edutainment? Or edutainment. Is my with me? Yeah, edutainment. Okay, all right, all right, because sometimes I hear things. So Yeah, it's educa <laughs> education and entertainment, which is what's happening right here, right now. But what else do you want our listeners to know about you? I'm going to be adding a new post-nominal to my, my list of various accreditations. It's uh, kind of unofficial. Uh, do you know what a sugar glider is? Yeah. Okay, those so, little flying, those little, yeah, those adorable flying little like squirrel kind of like thingies, adorable, <laughs> adorable shit. And I don't know why this is in my head or why I'm telling the story, but I'm going to run with it. A few years ago, one found its way into my house, and I just thought it was a squirrel, so I started chasing this little bastard, <laughs> and was going up and downstairs and running around the house, and then I caught it, and then just as I was throwing it out the door because I figured it should be outside and that's where it wants to go, I was like, shit, this is a sugar glider, could be a pet, and then it. It flew off. Now, catching a sugar glider is extremely hard, and I'm convinced I'm the only one that's ever done it by hand. So my new post-nominal is Master Sugar Glider Catcher. It's fucking MS, <laughs> MSC. <laughs> so in order for, for your oh listeners my God. To, really, to really understand who they're talking with, I want to put fuck all the sommelier accreditations, and, you know, I, I won Best Young Sommelier, kick some people's asses, and blah, blah, whatever. Master Sugar Glider Catcher. So 
All right. That's it. That's it. And guess sugar who's Googling glider Sugar Glider right now? <laughs> guess who? They're, they're guess adorable who? as hell. They are so cute. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I dare you try and catch one if you think I'm lying. I've never seen um, one. What happened to that sugar glider? Did it really just disappear into the darkness? Yeah, he got he got a home. And, you know, I don't know why I'm thinking about that, but I was recently uh, down in, in, in Guatemala doing some, like, uh, wasn't doing work research. They're really not known too much for their, their fermented beverages, although, you know, you can get some, some pretty bogus sugarcane-based things down there. And, oh, cacao will be my new new jam, like, uh, cacao hot cocoa in its most formidable manifestation is, is something I love. But I was down there doing some vision questing type shit and I was sitting out on the dock and there was a dude who kind of looked like the Zohan. If you ever seen that yeah. by Adam Sandler, um, and he coincidentally was from Israel and was this, you know, this tall, slender, beautiful young man with a beard that had to have some beard oil going on it. And uh, we got on the topic of sugar, sugar gliders, and he was jealous of my, my, my post nominals. That's why I think I'm still thinking about sugar gliders. So, any case, I think we should definitely talk about shift drink because that's awesome and fun at some point in time. And then you guys said you were you went to the brandy thing. It, that was the thing in Portland, right? The brandy seminar. That was yes. That was the one with yeah. all the bottles. That you know, how much is this bottle? Doesn't matter. You can't buy it. Oh, and God bless that product. That product saved my ass because I had been traveling. I'd been on the road for a bit traveling. I think that was right after Ed and I did. Yeah, it was. It was right after Ed and I did our shift drink podcast, like European tour. And I just got in the night before and I was in horrible shape. And I think I said at the beginning, I was like, look, if I totally blow this presentation, like if I really suck, you should all still be happy because the product is so goddamn good. Um, yeah, you and, were like in cold sweats or something. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. I, I just, I, it, it's you know, it's if people think that our gigs largely are, it's it's all glamour, and I'm just, you know, we as beverage professionals go check in at the Sofitel off the Champs Elysees and then go <laughs> taste wines at a cheese shop. But, you know, no. I mean, traveling is it can be rough, and let's face it, we're all really good at putting beautiful, but can be toxic things into our body and that was at the me that presentation was me at the end of like eight weeks trying to be somewhat charming and you know articulate but really sweating out a lot of toxicity and then just wanting to crawl in bed but yeah. the the brandies were beautiful oh they were you had that i think i wrote there was the tomato brandy so good and yeah. the weird Austrian brandy aged in a crystal balloon for 11 years, something like what that. What the fuck? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the tomato heirloom brandy is by Laurent uh, Cazot, mm -hmm. uh, which is imported by a buddy of mine, uh, Nico, Nicolas Polazzi, who imports through uh, PM Spirits. And he just brings in these beautiful products. And this producer is a couple hundred kilometers outside of Toulouse and has a farm that's all biodynamic and um is just like a little crazy hermit and he makes brandy out of the most weird peculiar things and they're 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 gorgeous uh and in the rochelle oh uh, so expensive but so delicious i mean half bottles of that are going out at you know 300 350 retail and more but the concentration and purity of, of the fruit that the, that distiller is able to to to, to bring to life it, it, it's it's one of those beverages like you just smell it for 20 minutes you don't even need to taste it yeah or, or put it to tongue you know it's just savory and inviting and uh charged and electric and intimate in the glass um that's the kind of shit that I, honestly as, as a beverage professional i kind of i need anymore because i think the longer you do this kind of work it, it can be easy to get jaded you know yes. yeah. gee, you know <laughs> Oh, I got I to gotta take another trip this year. It, it, just horrible, pathetic things like that. But we get we get jaded when it comes to food, and we get jaded when it when it comes to to beverage. And it's rare that I think we we really get amazed, like genuine amazed. And to me, those are the moments where it's like something I've never tried or something I had not or uh, conceived. And wow, you know, uh, things just like that that heirloom tomato, um, O to V. So. That actually, Arthur, is one of the three things that Val and I had a whole episode that was on what's not glamorous about being in the wine industry, you know, oh because 
you know, that's something worth talking about. People, you're right. They think that you just fly into Paris and, you know, have these magical trips that sound like vacation, but it's not like that. No, I mean, the wine business is just like any other business. It is a business, which means that it is, you know, profit driven. We're talking about numbers and tragically we're, we're talking about fucking widgets, man. I mean, the vast majority of people in our business, they're not in it because uh, what they learned from their father or their mother. They're not in it um, because they've had this 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 calling to to, to beverage or they, they feel obligated to, to to share their experiences with the world and you know, whatever. Uh, it's it's largely a numbers game. You're dealing with salespeople. You're dealing with sales forces. You're dealing with goals. You're dealing a lot with people who don't have the same kind of passion that you have, and you need to check that. You know, like I love it whenever a beverage professional moves from either working on premise and having um, having the ability as a buyer to develop the program that they want, and they they want to have weird esoteric things. So they can share those weird esoteric things with them. But, you know, say that same buyer gets a job in wholesale and, you know, they, they show up to a meeting and they're like, I didn't hear any goals on, on peak poo. Did, I'm sorry. Did, we, <laughs> did, did I miss the number I was supposed to hit against peak poo? It's like, no, because there isn't one. Go sell some fucking Chaco vine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like we're paying you to. And, oh, by the way, uh, I've really been working on not saying things that offend people. So if anyone out there makes Chaco vine or is a purveyor of Chaco wine or is, is an enjoyer of, of Chaco vine or is related or in a relationship with anyone <laughs> that digs on Chaco vine, I, I'm not judging right on. Go for it. Ultimately, the most important thing is, is pleasure and, and, and having a good time. Yeah, we, we try not to drink shame people because we want people to enjoy alcohol. And again, that's how a lot of people make, that's how the distributors make their business by selling wine, you know, so... I say drink what you like. Everybody has their own taste. And I always say if the whole world liked chocolate ice cream, then there wouldn't be any left for Val. So Nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I never really had the sweet tooth until recently. And I think my cacao experience has kind of done that, which is uh, peculiar because it's not like I'm getting really awesome cacao back here now in the States, uh, mm -hmm. or at least I haven't had enough time to settle in and find purveyors of it. But I've used it as justification to open up a sweet tooth and start eating chocolate and things like that more often one more thing for my waistline and my liver that's another thing that people don't realize about our wonderful industry is you got to take care of that shit you got to take care of your health um, weight management detoxing tea you're drinking tea with ginger god bless ginger uh -huh. yeah yeah well that's it i mean it's the balance of it all and you know you have to take some time off here and there or just reel it in and cut back your calories. And we've even had some good conversations about that on the show with some other uh, industry folks, because that is a tough, I mean, it's, uh, for me, I find that it's really, it's difficult to um, take care of my liver. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, hey, man, that's, you just let me know. I've, I've got all sorts of <laughs> bits, and bits of advice I could give there. Um, okay, good. I will uh, hold you to that. It, it comes down to discipline, you know, yeah. and, 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 and being mindful of everything that you put in your body. Um, there are little things you know, that people say. A lot of people speak to the, to the medicinal properties for the liver for um, milk tooth or, for that matter, a dandelion root and, uh, let's see, turmeric as well as chamomile, artichoke extract. Uh, needless to say, I have my own herbal remedy to get <laughs> one on over here. But, yeah, it, it, just, it just comes down to um, – to balance, which is something I try to do, but oftentimes uh, fail. I think I achieve balance in life by the various extremes colliding, you know, being super conscious when it comes to physical things and health things, but also knowing that I am comp uh, constantly putting my body in compromising positions, you know, eating too much, drinking too much, and then doing too much yoga or going to the gym or trying to put my feet behind my head, things like that. <laughs> Today was a feet behind the head day, actually. Lots of stretching today because yeah. I wasn't feeling too great in practice. I think those yeah. days are gone for me, but there there was a time when I could, I probably still could, but I don't, you know, you, you hit 50 and stuff goes woo. But let's get back to the podcast real quick because Yo. I'm kind of curious about how that all got started and maybe even talk about the the beginning, some of your favorite interview moments and all that. Yeah, so the podcast literally was born 
of um, me and my buddy Ed Rudisell, who uh, owns a handful of restaurants here in Indianapolis. Um, really, really great uh, independence, black market, Rook, uh, part owner in Thunderbird, really kick ass um, craft cocktail bar, and then uh, Siam Square, a Thai place. And they're getting ready to open. This would be so awesome. So if anyone's coming through the Midwest or coming to Indianapolis, by all means, feel free to you know to reach out to me. But check out a place called Inferno Room. It's going to be opening up. This is Ed's uh, new project, and it's it's a tiki bar. And it's there's no doubt in my mind it's going to be on par with like you know Dirty Dicks in Paris and uh, you know Smuggler's Cove. And, and it, well, it, those are lofty comparisons. It's going to get some recognition immediately out the gate with what they're doing. I should I should feel more comfortable in, in describing it that way. But he Ed is a huge rum dude. Uh, he and his buddy, uh, a mutual friend of ours, Chris Coy, uh, they're rum dudes, and we would go down to Miami. We went uh, a few times to to Rum Fest down in Miami, and uh, we were staying in this this cool little Airbnb, not too far away, but far enough, uh, thankfully, from South Beach. Uh, what a <laughs> fucking place, man! South Beach, um, just stacked full of hay babies there was actually <laughs> a hay ba- what's a hay baby <laughs> you know what a hay baby is no uh, a, hay- a hay baby is someone who like you're walking down the street and some dude's like hey baby oh uh, that that's a hay baby so okay. you know, <laughs> anyone who would actually do that it kind of sums up their overall character but <laughs> anyways there's so many hay babies in, in in south beach but you know miami's still an extremely fun time with a really great you know food and beverage community so we were down there for rum fest and we were hanging out at like 4 or 5 a.m we kind of closed everything down and uh had exhausted our walk around the streets and we're at our uh condo and just talking about podcasts and like how most of them suck because he travels a decent amount i travel a decent amount and, you know, I listened to lots of audio books and podcasts and things like that. We got back in town and we looked into some of the equipment and kind of threw around ideas. And you know, since he owns a handful of restaurants and I work in a lot of different ways in the way of marketing and promotion, it wasn't anything for us to kind of come up with a, a name and come up with, um, you know, a logo and then get a little bit of an assist from a production guy and get a website set up. And then like now it's probably like a year and a half, 40 plus episodes later. It, it, it started kind of like a, it was always going to be community. So it was always going to be uh, beverage, food, gastronomy as a whole. Uh, we wanted to keep it some somewhat centric on, like, if not in the Annapolis, but the up and coming cities around the country that are uh, are cultivating food and beverage cultures right now that are starting to rival some of the larger cities and I, we're both from Indianapolis we're both from the Midwest we're pretty laid back you know genuine kind of people or at least I like to think we are we just we love food and we love beverage and we started making calls from our various contacts in the wine world and beer world and spirit and wholesale and food and we've had some great fucking guests but like probably better than I think we deserve. Um, we interviewed Sherry Murano, um, you know, MW one time we, uh, took it on the road and went to like Amsterdam and then Paris and Strasbourg interviewed, uh, the, the owner hiding in plain sight, really kick-ass cocktail bar in, in Amsterdam. We've covered damn near every alcoholic genre. It seems like breweries, with uh, different brewers and um, breweries around the country. And then we, uh, there's a cat out of New York who's kind of like the spice guru and has been developing a name for himself as, as a spice guru. He wrote a kick ass book called The Spice Companion. His name's Lior um, Cesar. He owns uh, Le Boit in Hell's Kitchen, New York. We were able to interview him, and that was really exciting. And then Ed wanted to do something on bees because let's face it, bees are fucking awesome. Uh, go hug a bee, hug a bee. They're uh, they're good for the world. He wanted to do a thing on bees and like a local beekeeper, so providing honey to to different you know retailers and things like that. And then I wanted to do something involving alcohol, so I was like, mead. Let's do a thing on mead, yo. Uh, so we did a thing on bees and honey production, the history of honey, and then that just segued right into to mead, which allowed me to talk about Vikings which uh, is something I'm always looking to, to talk to. I, I, I got a big biking thing. Biking or Vikings? What did you say? 
Vikings. Vikings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, 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 it's weird. I know, but I got a thing for like battle axes and swords and shit. I thought that's what you uh, said. I was like, did he say biking or Vikings? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Vikings. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, I do like Vikings. And since uh, we were talking about mead, you know, you get to, to talk about the, like the history of mead, which is fascinating. Uh, and had that segued into uh, to Vikings. And, There's you know, a cool Viking uh, museum. Have you been to Norway before? No, but I want to go. Oh my gosh, the Viking museums out there—they're really awesome. <laughs> I bet. No, yeah. I, I, I would show up in costume, man. <laughs> and yeah, you should. I, I wouldn't have to buy anything. I could just grab shit <laughs> from around the apartment. Uh, right. Which is kind of funny. I, like, I've been tasked to do different, you know, I do a lot of cocktail competitions and judging and things like that. And I think this past Halloween, I showed up to like two or three cocktail competitions dressed up like Thor or something. I don't know. It, 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 was, it was a good idea when I had it. But Uber people might freak out when you step into a car with like a five foot sword. Maybe. Maybe. Right. So you have all these interests and then you have all yeah. these certifications that are so varied everything from sake and then to spirits mm -hmm. so do you have a favorite subject that you like to to teach about or to talk about in a seminar or what have you i i try not to speak about things if they're not worth speaking about you know if that isn't like completely mr obvious something i think that probably makes my position or at least what i do or, and have done professionally for the past several years which is, is kind of unique is i have a lot of autonomy. I can kind of talk about what I want for work and focus on what I want for work and my employers trust that I'll do right by them to, to drive sales in my own ways. So I get to come up with, you know, cool topics and, and, and twists on things to, to lecture about. Not that I haven't done, you know, my share of seminars on industrious, you know, bogus product. It's, it's a part of it. They keep the lights on in our work. But I, I really like to talk about subjects that have historical relevance. You know, you mentioned sake. Um, sake to me is one of the most beautiful beverages in the world, and it very much, like mezcal, are like they're both things that people have heard of. They've heard the word before. It it, it pulls out certain images. Um, you know, you think about mezcal, and you're like, oh, I don't know, tacos, worm in a bottle, something. But no one really knows shit about mezcal. Uh, you think here's sake, and people are like, I think of sushi, and it has something to do with Japan. Maybe if you come across someone who's particularly savvy that isn't in our business, maybe they know that it involves rice. But otherwise, sake, no one really knows shit about sake, which is unfortunate because it's yeah. a beautiful beverage and it's very historically relevant. Um, the culture of sake within Japanese culture, oh, I mean, those when I can speak to all those other elements and take in like other interests that all cross over and are relevant to the spirit we're talking about, the history of the spirit, production of the spirit, how production came um, <clears throat> into being, because uh, those, those, those are always going to be tied um, to, to the culture of a region, or at least should be tied to the culture of a region. Um, and then addition to science. I mean, I love the science for no other reason that I love to actually – take all this shit that we just romance and all the stuff that we, we speak and all these lofty descriptions and about these topics that engender passion, but you can still break down to a science. There's like, there's a reason why your beverage looks and tastes the way it does. And it's always been important for me to understand the science and communicate the science as a beverage professional to back up all the other things that could conceivably be subjective and, and, and in nature, you know, like, if someone come in, can come in and talk to me about why their wine smells of inner tube tire or <laughs> tennis ball or, you know, uh, petrol or diesel, of course, I'm talking about Riesling and it's, you know, uh, wonderful aromatic of, uh, was it, trimethyl hydrodoptylene. If someone can pull out those nuances in a glass of wine, that's cool. But if someone knows that that's actually like a vascular issue during the ripening of grapes and it's a polarizing topic to where some winemakers see it as a flaw and other winemakers um, see it as terroir or as a positive. Like that's the kind of substance that I try and back up in all my lectures where I'm otherwise offending somebody or dropping an F-bomb. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> you can get the man bun and the references to Vikings, but I'm also going to talk about, you know, terpenes or I'm going to speak about polyphenolics or I'm going to, you know, whatever, you know, fusel alcohols or whatever the topic is at hand. So um, I kind of like to, to bring it 
all, which sometimes comes out as rather scattered, but I always try and tie it back in and, and, and bring some focus. So I love how you retain it all too, because for some reason it's my, my retention isn't, isn't what it is. Cause I'm sitting there thinking, Oh, I want to do the MW program, but my, I'm not retaining anything right now. And so I'm amazed at how you can just, like you said this morning, you could just rattle off the soil structures of the Loire, but we can't translate time zones, you know, what have you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I was going to call you two hours earlier and I was like, I was dead set on it. And I'm like, dude, you're a fucking idiot, man. Oh, really? I am too. I thought the same thing. <laughs> I mean, not you. I thought I was like, oh, I, I had the time wrong. Yeah, yeah. Educators, I think, go through do different periods in their life. I, I've been an educator for a long time, and I, um, I'm wrapping up my 40th year. I turned 41 like a week or so from now, I think. What's the date today? 14, 15, uh, 15 March. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, shit. Monday. Okay, yeah. Monday I turned 41, which uh, you know I'm stoked about because I need to put fucking 40 in a basket man and ship it out on the water and then from afar shoot a bear a bow and arrow that's on fire uh and then and, and put that shit to bed no but, viking uh, funerals <laughs> oh no, that's the way i want to go man wouldn't that be awesome or at least give me like a pyre you know like put me on a bed of sticks and put some fucking coins on my eyeballs and light it up uh <laughs> oh yeah oh my gosh well i think i think this is a good time to talk about an embarrassing wine story because i'm sure now you know maybe it had something to do with your birthday or maybe it had to do something you know in your 20s but there's got to be a good gem out there Arthur. i would say pick a genre and then give me a statute of limitations and i'll <laughs> i'll pull one for my roller deck um you know, uh, yeah, there's, wow, there's been a lot of dumb things I've done um, and lots and lots of embarrassing stories. But my, my number one rule as a beverage professional is if I don't remember, it didn't happen. Um, that's gotten a lot harder <laughs> with all of our <laughs> space phones now. Yes. And yeah. Let me just throw you out there to you listeners. If there are any young professionals out there that are in the beverage community and you're inclined to catch everything on tape, or video on your phone. Uh, fuck you. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I mean, the, the, some things are sacred. People do stupid things sometimes on alcohol. You don't need to record it and post it on Facebook, you assholes. <laughs> uh, not that this ever happened to me, but uh, I'm sure it has. That's why I don't, I stopped Googling myself a couple of years ago. <laughs> like, you never know what you're going to find. The internet's a dangerous thing. Probably one of the dumbest things. Uh, I did was as a green professional, and this happened oh, probably 12, 15 years ago. So the, the, a lot of people that involved hopefully won't remember. They're probably not listening. I had just gotten hired into wholesale and started working for a distributor. Didn't know quite how things worked on the other side of, of, of business because I had been working off-premise and on-premise at, at wineries and retailers. Um, so I get this gig in wholesale. And we have a, an annual manager's meeting and we rent out some space and we kind of make it like a couple day thing. And we have a lot of managers in our company. So we had to, uh, we had to share space. So I, I ended up getting a room. I was assigned a room with some dude I'd never met before and, uh, whatever. Hey, Hey, hey how you doing? Whatever. I don't care. You know, um, I'm spoiled now. I'd fuck sharing rooms. Um, <laughs> We're the same way, so we're so the same way. We don't share our rooms either. Yeah, yeah. I'm 40 years old. I'll sleep in an avocado tree before I need to, <laughs> you know, share a hotel with someone else uh, these days. But so we were having our managers' meetings, and this was this was like 15 years ago. And our industry uh, at large has, has has dramatically changed in the past 15 years. Um, I would say in the past five, years, 10 years, it, it's changed considerably uh, with larger wholesalers buying out smaller uh, wholesalers and everything like the corporate nature of our industry. We've, we've had this kind of shift from, you know, handshakes and relationships and, you know, good old boy relations into, uh, and, and, and into, to bigger business. And with bigger business comes corporate policies and, you know, more structure on, on human resources standards and things like that. But uh, 15 years ago, it was it was still a little good old boy. And this this first night we're at this manager's meeting, everyone just gets annihilated. 
you know, like everyone was drinking very heavy and this was like, whoa, like this is what I do with my buddies, but I never thought we would do this at work. I was dealing with a lot of people like on the spirit side of wholesale and, you know, people were passing out shots and this isn't during a meeting, of course, this is, you know, in the evening as we're, you know, all team building or whatever you want to call it. So I, I said the first night, all right, this is how this works. I can get a little bit crunk and I can have some fun with this. And then the next night, it was the last night of the manager's meeting and we were all downstairs in the reception area and then some of our key account managers wanted to go out and get in a hot tub and I was like, sweet, the chance to get naked. So I ran out and got in the hot tub and then they closed down the hot tub so we all had to go back inside. But I was just going to grab a bottle of water and go to my room because I drank way too much. But I walked in, I got stuck in a conversation back in the reception area. So while I was getting my bottle of water, I proceeded to stand there with a towel covering me, dripping wet in the middle of our reception area at our manager's meeting. And my boss came up and said, unacceptable, you need to go to your room. So walking down the hallway, kind of looking like I'm on my way to a toga party, I make my way back up to my room and I go to bed and then I wake up and I go to the bathroom in the morning and I hear from the other room, uh, glad to see that you made it. I was kind of like, okay, that's not good. Hmm. Uh, so I finished going to the bathroom, and I kind of walked back into the room, scratching my head to this guy who I'd never really met before, but I was sharing a room with. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? He's like, glad I finally made it. He was like, yeah, last night I woke up, and uh, <laughs> you, you, you were pissing in the closet all over my luggage. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Now, that's not the funny thing. Um, <laughs> There's a a bunch of funny things here. One, this guy had to present the next day in front of the entire company, and I pissed all over his suit. So he had to (laughs) present pretty much where he was kind of dressed like John Travolta in Pulp Fiction in that scene where they're like outside getting sprayed off with the hose by Quentin Tarantino, you know, like basically like swimming trunks and a T-shirt. That's what he had to present in because I pissed on his suit. So that is one of the funny things. Um Another one of the funny things was that this image in my head that I've never met this guy before. He doesn't know me from anybody, but I am a little bit of a a bigger, stockier kind of guy. And I got lots of tattoos or whatever. And he wakes up in the middle of the night with his roommate pissing on his luggage on his side of the closet. Mind you, my side of the closet, fine. Not a drop. Totally perfect wearable conditions for my suits. But like... He's, he was kind of a, a timid fella. Um, I could just see him like with his head behind the blankets like, uh, Arthur, Arthur. And then apparently I just kind of turned back at him and growled something and went <laughs> back to pissing on his luggage. Um, so that's another one of the funny things about it. And, of course, it didn't take long for this to get out. Well, one, his boss asked him, why are you dressed like you're going to Disneyland? when you're giving a presentation uh, and of course his response was, well, I roomed with Arthur and he pissed all over my luggage. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that needless to say got out around the company. So, you know, Monday I come into the office, I'm walking down cube city and someone walks past me and was like, what's up Tinkerbell? Um, I'm like, ah, oh, shit. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm never going to let this down. And I sit in my cube and then my boss walks by and was like, my office. And <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Walking. Yeah. Um, so I walked down to his office and he's like, how's it going? I'm like, good. How's it going? He's like, good. Because uh, some, something was brought to my attention. Is there anything that we need to talk about at the manager's meeting? I was like, what? Like me pissing on what's his name's clothes? He was like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, he said, it's just something that happens awesome, often. <laughs> like, Do we need to worry about this in the future? Do we need to get you in your own room? And uh, I was like, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I would love my own room. Um, <laughs> but no, I ended up paying for the guy's dry cleaning. It, that was like my one pass being green in the wholesale business. Like, okay, so what, Arthur, you know, pissed on some guy's luggage. Um, tragically, there are a lot worse things that happen in our industry than something like that happened. But I don't think I've urinated on anybody else's luggage since. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Restraint. Growth. Growth. That is probably the most unusual wine story I think we've had. <laughs> I, I think, think we've so. had, Steph. I don't know. Uh, I think I think so. There isn't anything that is even near that. So, uh, listeners, if you are just getting into the industry, there are perils, obviously. 
<laughs> and we do have a yeah. lot of listeners who either are either just getting into the industry, want to get into the industry, or they're just aficionados. And so, you know, it is an interesting perspective that you're giving us today that I don't think a lot of people realize. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting perspective. <laughs> Tell us another urinating story, Arthur. No, Come no. <laughs> um, but, you know, but it, 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 our industry is a wonderful industry. I mean, it, it really, really, really is. But if you're, you aren't able to largely maintain, uh, you know, a sense of discipline, uh, and ultimately, you know, you, you, you work hard, you play hard. You know, I mean, we get a lot of entertaining. We get to go to lots of awesome wineries and breweries and distilleries and these trips and incentive trips and payoff trips and things like that um, that most people don't get a, a chance to to experience. But you are talking about alcohol. Things do and can go south. Um, if you're someone who doesn't handle alcohol well, you know, if you're an angry drunk, you probably don't want to go into the alcohol business. Yeah. You know, it, it might be a short career. Um, if you can't, you know, handle yourself by and large, and we, we all know those people are those people or, or have experienced those people. That is most people go a, a, a certain path. They do restaurants, they do retail, maybe they get into wholesale, working in through wholesale, they're working way up through sales. Perhaps they land a good gig working fine wine sales where they're not, um, just, you know, schlepping boxes of wine in, in their chain divisions. Um, very few actually will rise to the ranks or, or that's a horrible way of saying it. We'll, we'll be fortunate enough to have found circumstances that allow them to focus on education, product specialty, um, the things that, that I work with, um, the things that, that you guys work with. It's, it's, you're working by and large with products of choice, you know, um, you choose to, to represent these things or you don't have, you know, numbers lingering over your head. And that, that's a hard position to, to kind of carve out. Um, I lecture at universities here and there. People bring me in to talk to their hospitality departments, and yeah, you know, the worst thing someone could ask me is like, "How do I, how do I do what you do?" Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. You don't. No, don't do it. I wouldn't recommend it. Like, for almost twenty years now, I've somehow because I know something about something, and I'm not talking about blackmail shit here. Um, surprisingly, <laughs> but because I have a certain degree of of, of product speciality. Um, I've been able to convince people to pay me to just go around and eat shit and taste shit and, and, and speak to it. Right. And I'm, I'm very blessed in doing that because very few people. So I started working in education maybe 15, 20 years ago. Like a lot of my friends around the country, a lot of very famous wine experts and spirits experts out there were working education oriented gigs. And, and when the economy went to shit, like 10 years ago, vast majority of people around the country, a lot of large companies were dumping a lot of educators and, you know, quote, experts. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you're not tied to a commission. You're not immediate dollars in hand. We educators have to convince their employers um, that what they're doing, working with uh, sales teams, working with consumers, being ambassadors for different genre of spirit and wine, being ambassadors for different uh, properties or, or actual labels, is definitely a, 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 a positive thing. It's, it's worth having in your arsenal going out in this business to have specialized, educated people. But if something were to go south with my company next week and they had to let some people go, you think they're going to let go a salesperson that's running a $3 million route? Or what about this educator who seems to be very knowledgeable about shit but has a salary and then has a very large expense account that costs us lots of money? And why is he expensing like $1,000 in Guatemala? Which I didn't actually, <laughs> surprisingly. I think that's a, an important lesson to take away too also because sometimes when you love something – I think I've spent more on wine education than I've made back from it. Probably. Yeah. To be honest. Yeah. Because, you know, well, that living in Italy for a year thing, I'll, that'll, that'll mess with your budget right there. But the whole thing is if I could just go to school and write and talk about wine full time, that's, that's all I would do. Just be a scholar. And I don't, I don't have any idea. I don't have any desire to keep the long hours and walk home from the restaurant at 11 o'clock at night. And <laughs> I just don't. You know, it's not something I want to do. I just want to study it and love it. And I think once you turn it into your vocation, you might you might lose passion for it or you might gain more passion for it. It depends. So you have to figure out what it is that 
feeds your soul when it comes to yeah i, I loved working in restaurants i love working with people but it, it is there, there are long hours working in a restaurant it's mm-hmm. it's hard on the body it's, it's oftentimes a thankless position you know where you you do your best to provide a certain service and an experience and it's it falls on deaf ears oftentimes a fraction of people actually get the time or the work you've put into your to your studies and your profession it can be the less than gratifying position unfortunately on the wholesale side and as an educator if you can keep it about the passion and the love that that's wonderful um sometimes numbers do take priority which is mm-hmm. a bummer and it's very easy and i would urge like young beverage professionals to at least come to terms with the fact that not everything you're going to do you're not always going to be able to sell that wine that you love to sell like there's things you have to sell and there are things that you have the privilege to sell uh, sometimes there's overlap. Um, you know, if you're working with a company and they have an extremely uh, profitable brand, that might not be your favorite. Um, I'm not going to name any wine labels right now that I, I think are, <laughs> but people love them. One, I don't want to take that away from them, and two, I acknowledge the the place of these products in the market. You can't let yourself get jaded by that. Like I, I went through a young beverage professional period where I was kind of angry. And it's like, how dare like people not get how awesome this is, uh, or you know, uh, have a chip on my shoulder like, you know, this isn't real fucking wine, or this isn't terroir, or this isn't craft, or this isn't boot, whatever. Um, don't let that bring down your enjoyment, and don't let the actual work of the position um, bring down your your the reason why you, you got into it. You know? Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's a good place to to end it with a good piece of advice too unless you guys have turned us off by now which i hope you haven't (laughs) so most likely these things are all white noise you just turn them on and listen to them while you drive and get on the treadmill so well before we let you go arthur uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us today this is definitely going to be a fun unique episode for everybody but where can our listeners find you and connect with you in the social spaces and uh and again feel free to plug the podcast as well I'm really horrible with uh, self-promotion. Okay. So Shift Drink is, is a good way. I mean, if you felt compelled to, to listen to peculiar things on a, every other weekly basis, uh, between Ed and I, I, I definitely recommend it. We try and make it edu... What the hell did you say? Edutainment. 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 All right, yeah. We, <laughs> we try and go for that. And, I mean, if anybody has anything they want to tap me on specifically, I'd... I'm pretty much an open book. So, you know, anyone could either go to the Shift Drink Podcast website, um, tag Ed or I with a question or a comment, or just reach out to me directly on social media. As far as I know, there's one, there's only one Arthur Black with a man bun and lots of tattoos uh, in the beverage industry that I can think of. I haven't met any doppelgangers yet. Um, but yeah, uh, whatever, however, anything I can ever do to help any listener with thoughts or meditation or uh, information, I am worth nothing else besides uh, a laugh and um, useless tidbits on, on alcohol. In the way of acquiring accreditations, I've worked with damn near every educational body out there, whether it's WSET, NW, MS, Society of Wine Educators. Um, any thoughts and meditations on those, I would, I would welcome inquiries and otherwise i'll I'll probably just see you guys at a conference here yeah. or there but otherwise i'll just see you out there in the beverage community i appreciate your time stephanie and valerie thank you so much hey thank yeah. you so much thank this you. was a lot of fun cool well you guys enjoy the rest of your day and um cheers, cheers. I, I appreciate the time with you all right yeah Arthur. cheers man <laughs> take right. care guys bye-bye bye well, I think that was probably our wildest episode yet, Steph. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. I hope you guys really enjoyed keeping it real with Arthur Black. And if you need more Arthur Black in your life or want to reach out to him, you can definitely find him on Facebook at Shift Drink Podcast. That's S-H-I-F-T-D-R-I-N-K Podcast. Or on Twitter at Shift underscore Drink. Or at Arturo Negro. I know he doesn't hang out a lot on Twitter. Or on Instagram at Shift Drink Podcast. So if you want to get a hold of him, he, he's, you know, he'll offer you guys up some advice on competitions or, or whatever, or just check out the podcast. They've had some really good guests and it's, it's definitely a lot of fun and it's, it's not for the mamby pamby. <laughs> Well, now it's time for the shout outs, though, because this is the good part that we love our 
patrons who support us on the crowdfunding platform Patreon. And we hope you guys enjoyed this show. Thank you so much, Robin Sals. She is our Reserva Superiore supporter. Robin from Girls Gone Grape. And our tenacious tasters, Jeff E. from the award-winning We Like Drinking podcast. Go check out that one if you have not yet. Lynn from Savor the Harvest blog. Sebastian of Sassy Italy tours. Jen in Maryland. David and Lisa in Illinois. And Anne-Marie in Virginia. And it's not 5 o'clock and we don't care, listeners. Thank you to our patrons, Meg in South Dakota, Clay in Arizona. John, Andrew, and Aswani in California, Chantel in Ontario, Mary Lou in Pennsylvania, Kathy in Georgia, Chris, Janet, and Diane in Colorado, Steve and Renee in Illinois, Kathy in Tennessee, Ashley in North Carolina, Sean in Ohio, and our Taste Maker listeners, David in Scotland, Carol in Kentucky, and Karen in California. And you can find out more about becoming a patron on our patreon.com forward slash wine25 podcast site. And we have a monthly drawing oh, yeah. to announce because all of our patrons get entered into a monthly drawing in addition to all of the exclusive content they get and the swag. So, Val, who's the winner this month? All right. So, I have here the paper bag of joy. Yeah, oh, drum roll. Yeah, drum roll. Kind of yeah. sounds like a drum roll. Renee. Renee. Oh, great. So, Renee, we will contact you and you will get either a Wine 25 t shirt or a Govino glass. So, up to your choosing, and we will let you know. Congratulations. Congratulations, Renee. And everybody, we're here for you every single week. You can find us in the social spaces between episodes at Wine to Five. And we encourage you to join our private Facebook group, also called Wine to Five Community. You can connect with me. I'm Val. I'm on Twitter and I'm at Wine Gal Unboxed and on Vino with Val's Facebook page or Instagram or Pinterest accounts. And Steph, you can find her everywhere online as The Wine Heroine. That, believe it or not, brings us to the end of this very long episode. I'm ready for another drink, Steph, of tea. (laughs) My glass is empty. (laughs) That's right. Cheers to that, Val, and I will see you next week. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO 5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful sip tips. (laughs) 